so uh, yeah, so we're very happy to have uh, Tian Xie from Microsoft Research uh, in Cambridge. Uh, so uh, Tian received his PhD and postdoc from MIT, and he just joined the Microsoft Research AI for Science team uh, earlier this year, and he'll be talking to us. He'll be talking to us about materials discovery using generative models. So Tian, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a really last minute. I really love to be here at uh, Morocco uh, to be with everybody. It's a, it's a really amazing set of speakers, and uh, and amazing discussions that has been happening. So, uh, but uh, I will be here giving a talk in virtual. But I hope to have the opportunity to connect with everybody, and also feel free to email me any questions if uh, you want to have a follow up discussion on this. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, rethinking material discovery uh, we, with generative models. And uh, so we think this, uh, we, we really, really hope to think uh, generative model as a new way to do material design that could potentially enable some new yeah. opportunities that would be hard to do before. So uh, around this time, uh, so just to note that uh, uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions in the middle, or I always like to be a little bit more interactive, but uh, if you have like really longer questions that you can, you can maybe reserve that at the end. So uh, at the end, uh, at around this time, I would always start like to start my talk with uh, the latest uh, COP uh, conference. So latest one was heard, uh, it's a United Nations Climate Change Conference that is organizing the global effort to combat climate change. So the latest one was just finished around a month ago uh, in Egypt. If, you, if you're like me who are following this COP conference every year, you would be amazed by how much progress we have been made in about climate change in the past uh, 10 years. For example, we can now see really electric cars running around or on the streets uh, very well. Uh, and you will also be, uh, be, uh, be, be, be thrilled by the, the, the huge amount of technology uh, uh, like uh, advances that we needed to do in the next 10 years in order to achieve uh, zero carbon emissions around uh, 2050. Uh, so one of the key goals that uh, we have set for ourselves uh, is the path towards uh, the uh, 1.5 degree increase uh, in the in the current century. So so this is the target. We're currently around 1.2 to 1.3. So there's a really very few room left if we want to achieve this goal uh, at around uh, 2050. So this is uh, one uh, projection uh, of from the latest uh, UN IPCC special report. Uh, this is uh, how how much we need to reduce CO two emissions uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, fifty years uh, if we wanted to achieve this uh, one point five degree uh, Celsius uh, increase in the global uh, climate change target. Uh, so, so the two paths in here, the, to achieve this path requires really a lot of new innovations that needs to happen uh, in the coming decades. First, we need to go beyond electric cars to significantly reduce the carbon emission over a broad set of sections around the society, which means that we need to have greater level energy storage to utilizing the solar and the wind power that was generated from renewable energy. We needed to reduce the carbon emissions from the producing of fertilizer, steels, and many other sectors in the site. And in, almost, in addition, in almost all this, uh, in all these projections, it requires a certain degree of a carbon negative technology means that we needed to be able to do at a very large gigaton scale carbon capture to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to achieve this 1.5 degree increase in the global temperature. Uh, so, 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 so to solve this problem, we need to have broad innovations in a lot of sectors uh, around the society. And, and many of them will be involved in discovering some new materials. For example, in order to find electric cars, uh, in order to electrify cars and plants, and in order to have grid, uh, grid level energy storage, we need to innovate in batteries, 
for, for, for finding better fuel cell fertilizer and then producing chemical products from zero carbon uh, sources, we needed to innovate in new catalysis. To do the carbon capture, we needed to find uh, materials that can storage gas. And all this actually comes back into a central problem of finding new materials for specific applications. So, uh, so what is so so so? Therefore, if we can make big innovations in accelerating the process of how we can do material design, it has a percent potential opportunity to make a broad impact in all these sectors. So, I hope that this introduction would make you excited about uh, this problem of material discovery. Uh, and I want to formally maybe try to upshot out what does that usually mean from a general setting perspective. So in a, in a typical material discovery problem, we want to find a new material that are satisfying a certain set of target properties that is defined by our target applications. For example, if you want to find a good battery material, uh, you need to find a material with good lithium-ion diffusivity. It needs to be thermodynamic stable. It also needs to be electrochemically stable. And uh, given this information, uh, so, so basically the goal is really to find a crystal structure of a material that satisfies those target properties, first computationally, and then you send these uh, predictions of crystal structures to the labs. They will synthesize this and measure its properties by building up some devices. And you would hope that this will end up becoming a battery material that can be eventually commercialized and made into a product manufactured at a very big scale. Uh, so so, so the, it has been a significant effort and a success in the past decade in using large scale computation and simulation to find new materials uh, 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 and has resulted in many experimental new discovery of materials in the past decade. This is a field called high throughput screening and it has been very successful. A typical works to look like this. Uh, you start uh, with a certain set of candidate of materials. Uh, usually this uh, means all the existing materials that we know experimentally. And then you set a, a set of criteria, uh, basically a set of simulators to gradually filter down the materials uh, based on these constraints. So, so, so you usually you have like five to 10 different constraints you want to satisfy for these materials. At the end, you may get maybe 10 candidates, which were then sent to the lab for synthesis and finding the best material. And then this is one example of such material that is being discovered using, using this pipeline. Uh, so, so, so this is uh, what has been done, has been proved, proven to be quite successful in the past decade. But uh, one problem with this previous paradigm is that it is fixed into this initial set of candidates. So, so, so for all this material discovery pipeline, you, your uh, high throughput screening work, you're always starting with this fixed set of candidates, which all the stable materials that we know, which is actually quite small, around 100,000 materials that uh, people use for most of the applications. So therefore, most of this high throughput work can be thought of as really repurposing known materials for new applications. So therefore, there is an opportunity to pursue a new paradigm where uh, while jointly, while you're optimizing for these properties you're interested in, you're you are at the same time exploring unknown materials that are previously uh, unknown materials that are potentially be synthesizable and stable, but also have those good properties. So this is the paradigm that we are pretty excited uh, at uh, MSR AI for Science to pursue. So why is it an interesting paradigm? First, it's obviously that uh, uh, it is there's a much bigger space out there of unknown materials compared with known materials. This is a rough estimate uh, from this paper to, to, to estimate what is this what's the size of this potential space. So it says that in this work, they show that, for example, if you, even if you're just looking for up to quaternary material, means materials made up with up to four elements and taking some assumptions, you have at least the 10 to the order of a 10th uh, uh, quaternary uh, stoichiometries. These are not considering crystal structures, only considering stoichiometry of the material. Uh, so it has is already been five orders of magnitude larger than the biggest database uh, uh, of, uh, of materials uh, structures out there. Uh, in addition, which I think is even more important, is that uh, in many of the key applications of material science, you really require to find the materials that have contradicting properties. 
uh, which are rare and non-exist in maybe in the natural world. Uh, one famous example is this so-called uh, thermoelectric materials, in which uh, you will need to find a material with good both good uh, electrical conductivity but a low thermal conductivity. Uh, so, but uh, this is uh, very hard because usually the charge carriers associated with these two conductivity are the same. So it is very hard to find uh, such a material with such contradicting properties. And this is a very typical problem for a lot of uh, material design tasks. So therefore, if you have an opportunity, have the capabilities to join in optimizing structures so that you can drive the discovery material towards the direction of this contradicting properties, you have the chance of discovering many breakthrough materials for a lot of applications that may not be possible before. Uh, so, however, even though I have mentioned the, the excitement of potentially exploring unknown materials, it is actually a very, very challenging task. Uh, so there are several uh, existing methods that can do that. First is so-called ab initial random structure search. The idea is that basically just to generate a huge amount of random structures uh, in the order of half a million. And the form which basically enumerate all possibilities and you use, D, you use a, a DFT, a quantum mechanical simulation to run everything in parallel and from which you find stable materials. But this is highly, this is highly inefficient uh, because uh, even even you're looking for this, uh, so so basically a typical success rate is that uh, if you run half a million calculation, you can only find maybe ten to twenty stable materials. So this is highly inefficient, inefficient, and obviously cannot scale up into the entire PR table. So therefore, there has been significant work to to explore another approach called a substitution approach. The idea is to take existing crystal structures and you substitute atom in it. Uh, so that you basically utilize existing structures to find the new structures. So this is the typical approach used by some of the biggest projects, yes. like my project. Uh, sorry, is there a question? I am hearing some, something. Um, sorry, Tian, can you can you continue, please? Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So basically, there is this substitution approach that has been used by broad, many uh, like biggest uh, uh, open projects like Matthias Project and OQMD, which to take existing structures and uh, substitute the atom in it from which you want to find a material, find, want a stable material. So let's first look at how far you can go with this substitution approach. So this is a work that was did by one of our colleagues, Chi Chen, who is also at Microsoft right now. And the idea is to take the existing structure of material or, or around the 5,000 seed materials from ICSD, and then you do isovalent substitution to keep the system charge neutral, from which you get around 32 million candidates. So that is uh, maybe around the 240 times bigger than materials project, one of the most popular open materials platform out there. So, so you already say that, okay, so if you wanted to use DFT to calculate all of this material, you, you, it will require huge amounts of calculations around the, uh, 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 2.47 billion CPU hours. That would be extremely expensive. So the idea is basically to train a ML potential. So, so in this work, uh, they, 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 they developed a type of a graph network called the MCG net, uh, uh, which I'm not going to details, but uh, it is a machine learning potential. Uh, I'm sure this audience uh, I know what the ML potential is, but basically it's a, it's a model that predicts the energy. And then in addition, you use the autograd to compute a force. And uh, what is special about the materials is that you also have a stress, which corresponding to the gradient with respect to the periodic cells. And uh, they train the ML potential using all the force data, all the relaxation data from the materials project. And uh, this gives you a ML potential that works for the entire periodic table. And they show that this ML potential can be running uh, a thousand times faster than the DFT. So in this work, they basically used this ML potential to relax all these 32 million candidates of materials. And they're predicting that around 1 million of these materials to be actually stable. And they selected the top uh, 1,000 candidates from these materials. And uh, they found that, that the significant portion of them are verified to be stable using DFT. 
And uh, this created one of the biggest uh, uh, machine learning predicted crystal structure data set out there, which can be accessed uh, from the from the DF, uh, from, from this website uh, called metaverse.ai. Uh, so there has also been great work uh, from Google Brain that is also uh, working in the substitution paradigm where they have been scaled this uh, into even bigger, bigger space out there. Uh, so, so, so it has, as you can see, it has been shown that the substitution has been quite successful in expanding the known material space, but uh, there is several limitations of this substitution approach. The first is that it is limited into existing material structure prototype. In, because it uses existing structures to kind of a substitute atoms. So therefore you can really not explore new materials. This, I think this is one of the major limitations of the substitution approach. And the second, the second limitation is that uh, you cannot really explore uh, unknown materials guided by the target properties. This becomes even property because the generation is unconditional, right? So you, you wanted to generate the materials without considering any properties. But at the end, you want to find the materials that satisfy target properties. So, so therefore, as you have more and more material space, now let's say you have a million materials, it becomes harder and harder to screen materials using the screening-based approach to, to basically looking at all the materials from, from which you find the materials. So therefore it becomes even more important uh, if you have a bigger data set to have the capabilities to generate materials directly using the target properties that you're interested in. So therefore this, I think, uh, motivates us why a generative model might be exciting. Uh, so, so, so the big idea of generative model is the following. Basically, we, we want to train a generative model by learning from the data, by learning from all these existing non-stable materials. And once you have this generative model, you can then sample new materials that are not that are new and novel, but also potentially stable. And uh, what is even more exciting is that uh, then you can do conditional generation. You can condition on target properties uh, that you're interested in. Let's say you wanted to condition on a, a, a good battery material and you can generate materials that directly satisfy those constraints for the batteries. And this will then this would allow you to more efficiently search materials uh, conditionally on the target properties compared with the, the unconditional exploration that you would have for the substitution based approaches. Uh, so, so now, so in the next few slides, I'm going to go a little bit details about uh, what do, how do we design this generative model for materials. Before that, I want to maybe, maybe first uh, formally define what do I mean by materials from a more mathematical perspective. So mathematically, a material is a, 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 a basic can be described by a N atoms in a 3D space plus a periodic lattice. Basically, materials are infinite periodic structure, so you can represent them using the atom types and the coordinate of these n atoms within this re repeating unit. And then you need to define periodicity using this uh, so-called lattice factor. So these are three vectors in the 3D space, L1, L2, L3, which defines the periodicity of a system along three directions. So once you have, so they don't have to be perpendicular to each other. So, uh, so, but they define the periodicity in three directions in the three dimensional space. So once you have L1, L2, L3, you can basically tile the entire 3D space by translating this unit cell, this repeating unit uh, along all the integer combinations of these uh, three lattice factors. So our objective for the generative model is really to jointly generating these three uh, vectors, atom types, coordinates, and the lattice that corresponds to a stable material. And the key challenge of achieving this is uh, first to basically handle periodicity because that is very unique for the periodic structure material. And the second is that you want to satisfy the symmetrical invariances of the material, including rotation, uh, translation, periodic invariance, and the permutation invariance. Uh, so, bef uh, so there has been quite a few works in the space in trying to uh, basically have a generative model uh, in, uh, in, in materials. I want to highlight a few works uh, uh, that is in the space. Uh, so, so, th so the first class of work is that they try, so they do not try to tackle the problem from a more like universal perspective, 
but they, they try to look at a subclass of material, but they exploit some of the, the, the inductive bias associated with this material. So for example, in this great work in which they try to generate a type of class material called MOFs, so which has very limited number of topology. So basically then they utilizing this topology to represent the material using a, a fixed uh, length feature representation material, and then basically build a simple auto encoder on top of it. Even though this method is very simple, it has been shown to be uh, discovering some new materials that are good for the carbon capture applications. So there is another very recent work that is published on science that are also looking at a subclass material called alloys. But then in this type of material, you're only looking at, so you're only looking at, uh, so, you, so, so, so high entropy alloys in this type of material, you're not necessarily interested in the structural material, but you are kind of ignoring the structural material, but then you're representing them uh, using the chemical composition, basically the ratio of how elements are mixed together. And then this can be then again represented by a fixed lens vector. And then they build a generative model to sample materials based on target properties they're interested in. And then using this to generate material, uh, then generate material that maximizing the, the certain mechanical behavior of these high, high entropy alloys. And then they have shown that you can, you can basically discover unknown high entropy alloys for a specific applications. So these are some of the existing works that have shown that has exploited some of the symmetric, uh, some of uh, 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 some of the inductive bias in for a subclass of material. Uh, so there has been also line work that really tries to develop a universal generative model for 3D crystals. So, so, so this can be summarized into the following three types of approaches. The first is basically a direct, uh, the direct representation uh, using of materials using these three vectors, uh, coordinate and atom type and coordination. Uh, uh, to just uh, encode this, uh, this as uh, a, a big a big matrix to represent the material structure. And the second idea is to represent the material structure as uh, 3D voxel images and build the auto encoder around this. But the one limitation about this approach is that they both lack the symmetric invariances that is required for materials. So, uh, so for example, you don't have rotational invariance, you don't have a permutation invariance in many of uh, in these approaches. Uh, the, the last approach, uh, so there's been also uh, a great line work in generating the 3D molecular structure material uh, using uh, using flow models and also diffusion models for for uh, for molecules. But uh, this work, but this line work has not been able to handle periodicity, and uh, and uh, and one of the limitations of this approach is also really to scale up into the entire PR table uh, so that you can extending this from a limited number of elements to all the elements in the periodic table. So this is where we have. Uh, uh, so so this is where we have uh, tried to to solve. Uh, so to solve this problem, uh, so we have developed uh, in uh, before uh, at your Microsoft, we have developed uh, this crystal diffusion variation auto encoder. This is uh, one of the first work uh, that first auto encoder for periodic uh, crystals that. Uh, First, satisfy all the symmetrical invariances that I have mentioned earlier, but also fully respects the periodicity of the materials. So I'm going to first to give you an overview about this approach, but then I'm going to a little bit details in the next few slides. At the highest level, uh, this uh, this uh, approach is a auto encoder. Uh, it has a encoder that encodes the 3D structure material into a latent vector, and then in the decoder it tries to decode this uh, back into the original 3D structure. So we we use graphic neural networks for both the encoder and the decoder. So therefore, uh, this is how we handle the symmetrical invariances of the material. Uh, and uh, the encoder part is basically very simple. It's just a, a normal graph network, but uh, handles the periodicity by building on the on the on the on the periodic graph of the material. So the key innovation part is the decoder, and then decoder is a and decoder part is a a diffusion model, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, in the next few slides. Uh, so I'm not sure how much this audience is familiar with diffusion models, but so I'm giving, I'm having a high level slide to explain what diffusion model is. So 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 this is uh, so this is a type of diffusion model called a denoiding score matching network. So but the big idea 
is uh, so it was first developed in the image space, but now being really extended into broader class of materials, uh, broader class of data classes, like say proteins and uh, also proteins, the molecules and the materials. So the big idea is that uh, basically you take the, 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 the data from your data distribution, the uh, real image, and in the training process, you add a noise into that image and uh, so this uh, this usually a Gaussian noise, and you gradually uh, no, uh, make uh, you add a Gaussian noise, and this gradually deforms this image into a random Gaussian generation. And uh, so, so in the training process, you basically train a neural network that tries to denoise this noisy image back into an original image. So therefore, in the generation part, you can directly sample from a random Gaussian noise, and this diffusion model will be able to generate uh, a, a realistic image uh, by basically uh, using uh, using this train network to denoising the Gaussian image. So the idea is for our model is very similar. Uh, we take the original uh, crystal, and during the training process, we add noise to both atom types and positions. And uh, this will gradually give us a, a complete noisy image. And we train that graphing network to denoise this noisy, uh, denoise this noisy crystal in the generation process in order to generate a stable crystal. Uh, so, so this generation process are done uh, via a two-step process. Uh, so uh, in, in the first in the first step, we start uh, for the decoder, we, we start from uh, the, this latent vector and we have a MLP, which is a property predictor that predicts three properties of uh, the pre crystal that we hope to generate. The first is the chemical composition, which defines a proper distribution over our elements, basically selecting two to five elements from all the elements in the periodic table. And the second is a lattice. Uh, we use a rotation in value representation of a lattice uh, so that uh, we de basically directly predict the periodicity, uh, periodic box uh, for the crystal that we hope to generate. The final is a, a number of elements we have in for the crystal. So given this three information, you can randomly initialize a structure uh, that uh, by randomly initialize both atom types and positions that are close to the final structure that we hope to predict. So the reason that we want to do this is because uh, this will significantly simplify the, the, the this uh, this uh, this uh, denoising, uh, so this diffusion model. So basically we can use this easy to predict properties to simplify the task with final generation of stable materials. Uh, so once we have this random initial structure, so the goal of the second step is basically to have a decoder network, a graphing network, to gradually deform this random initial structure into a final stable structure, so so this is done. Uh, so this is uh, so this is done by a graph network that is uh, that inputs a crystal structure, but also the latent vector. So it's a conditional graph neural network that uh, tries to deform this structure into the final structure, and it takes. Uh, so the input of the structure. Uh, so the input of graph neural network is the crystal structure. And the, the output are two information. One is that uh, you output a gradient for each node that points from a high energy uh, point uh, that, that high, points from a high energy structure to a low energy structure. O but obviously, we don't use any force data to train the model, so everything is trained via a denoising objective. And the second uh, output is probably diffusion. So it's a basic. Uh, so it tries to. Uh, update so this is part distribution of all the elements in the periodic table so the goal of this is to update atom types uh using the uh, using the local uh, using uh based on the surrounding environments of each node so 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 because it is graph network this ensures we satisfy all the symmetric environments that we require for representing a crystal structure uh, so, so the actual generation process is done through a so-called near the Langevin dynamics process. Uh, so, so I'm not going into details, but at high level, basically you have so so at a high level, uh, we have 50 noise levels from high to low during the generation process, and we do uh, we basically uh, do this uh, we apply this graph in our iteratively over 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 50 noise level and there are 100 steps for each noise level so so this is a kind of a similar to some of the previous works that has done for the for the images uh, for, sorry for the molecules uh, but we 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 up, uh, we update both atom type and coordinates in this process and uh, the edges 
uh, dynamically built in this update in order to pre uh, because this is necessary uh, if you have a fixed uh, edge uh, so this model will not work so all the edges are dynamically built in the generation process in addition we adapt periodicity uh, into this uh, launchment dynamics uh, update process uh, so here is a image that kind of shows how do we generate from a random initial structure to the final structure. As you can see, uh, so the final structure that we generate from this crystal uh, looks pretty realistic uh, if you are a material scientist. Uh, so let me just go over very quickly towards the training part. So, so the training, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, at high level, there are three networks in this uh, architecture. The first is the encoder network, the second is this uh, party predictor, and last one is the, the decoder network. So all three networks are trained together end to end uh, by taking in equilibrium structure, a uh, stable structure of materials. Uh, and there are three losses in this process. The first loss is this uh, decoder loss, which is basically trained via a denoising objective by adding noise to the to the to the input structure, and then this network uh, denoises uh, by 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 updating both atom types and positions. And then we have a second property prediction loss that predicts uh, the the. The, these three properties for the for the input crystal uh, uh, given this latent vector Z. And the last one is obviously the KR divergence loss for the variation of the encoder. Uh, so there are several special things about uh, this prop, uh, about uh, this crystal problem uh, a big, due to the periodicity that we need to introduce into our new network. The first is that uh, because we have periodicity, it actually influences uh, what is the target for our denoising objective. So here is one good example of how this would influence. So let's say this is a, so this is, I'm not sure if you can see the mouse, but this is, let's see, this is the, the initial stable structure of the material. But then if you add a noise into the stable structure, you add a, a noise into a stable structure, you get this structure. But uh, the second structure is actually the same as the original structure. So then you need to make a choice, right? So, 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 so what is your objective for your, for your denoising? So the first, uh, for non periodic system, what you would do is that you would basically take a vector from this xi uh, tilde to xi. This would be your objective for non, non, uh, for, for, for a non, <clears throat> for non periodic system. But because actually after adding noise, you're actually getting your original structure, right? So, so therefore, if uh, uh, so, therefore, if you're using that objective, basically, imagine if you how would you uh, so your network will be basically out regressing multiple targets for the same input, right? So because uh, this is the initial structure that you, you should uh, uh, so you should not change this. So so the output should be zero, right? So but uh, but due to your periodicity, now you have a different target. So so therefore, to eliminate this process. Uh, what we did is that basically you need, the target needs to be defined by by considering periodicity, basically taking the minimum distance of xi tilde and xi after taking into account of periodicity. So that is one special thing we did to, to handle the periodicity of the material. And the second is that uh, uh, we need to handle the, the 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 we need to have a unique representation for the lattice of the material, basically. Uh, because fundamentally materials are, are, is an infinite large structure, uh, and uh, but you're only representing it using its repeating unit. But however, for the same infinite large structure, you actually have many different ways of choosing the, the units and the repeating unit. So, so this in, again introduces this kind of a problem where which target you want to predict, uh, giving you ML, uh, MLP predictor. Uh, so we use an algorithm called the Nigli algorithm that is developed. Uh, so that is uh, pretty, uh, that is like pretty standard algorithm in the uh, crystallographic, uh, crystallographic community, which basically finds a unique lattice from an infinite possible choice of a lattice uh, for the crystal. So therefore, we have this unique representation of the lattice uh, in or for our predict property predictor. So uh, there is addition, in addition, uh, we also want to have a, a rotational inventory representation of the lattice. Basically, uh, basically, you can yes, you can represent this lattice with these three lattice factors, but uh, but uh, because if you rotate the lattice, it will still be the same material. So what we in our prediction, we actually reduce that 
into six parameters, length and angles, uh, length of these three vectors and the angles between them. This is a unique representation that is invariant to the rotation of the material. And so this is basically a big idea about uh, our, our new network architecture. So then the key, then the second question we're on. So now we have this model that really is the first uh, uh, geometric invariant, uh, the, the first uh, generative model for crystals that is geometric invariant to materials. So we wanted to understand uh, how much by introducing this geometric invariants can improve the model performance in some of the realistic material discovery problems. So in order to do so, we defined, uh, we, we, we curated a set of a data set and defined a set of metrics in order to quantifyly evaluate the performance of our model. Uh, so basically we curated the three data sets from the open DFT data sets. So for the first is a Priovsky data sets, they corresponding to uh, a set of materials that have very similar structure, but different chemistry. And the second data set we curate is called carbon-24. It has uh, all, all materials made of carbon, one single element, but they have different structures. So the last data set is the most realistic. It, we call it MP20 because it includes all the materials, that are, all the experimental and known materials with no more than 20 atoms uh, in the unit cell. And so we compare our model with a set of baselines, uh, including uh, FTCP, the state of art model for, for, for the model that directly encodes the atom type positions coordinates. Uh, and uh, the second is the CON DFC VAE, which is a state of art model, model for voxel based uh, variational auto uh, encoder for crystal generation. Uh, GCNET is one of the state of art model for generating non periodic. Uh, 3D molecules, and we adapt a version of it into which, which we call PGSNAT, which can handle periodicity for materials. And so, so the task we're comparing these models are uh, to, to, to basically generate 10,000 crystal structures for all these materials, and then we want to compare the quality of these generated materials. Uh, so here's a quick visualization about the structure that we're generating. So it is a little bit harder to see uh, how good they are if you are on, uh, so, but uh, as you can, uh, but one thing is it kind of clear is that, for example, FTCP generates really bad structures. If you, uh, you're kind of familiar with how good, uh, what do you mean by good stable material? And for the rest, it's a little bit harder to see just by looking at this image. So we define a set of a quantifiable metric to, to evaluate how good these materials are. The first is validity. Uh, so, so, so unlike molecules, it's very hard to define validity for crystals. So we use some of the very simple metrics. So the first is that that uh, we call structure validity. Basically, it just says that they're not they're not two two atoms that are too close to each other. So basically, the minimum distance between atoms should be larger than zero point five angstrom. Second is so called composition validity, the validity, which we just check all the chemistry we generate is charge neutral. And as you can see, uh, CDB is really, uh, really one of the models. Uh, so I, I just want to note that because uh, uh, the because this uh, this validity checkers are not perfect. So even the ground truth, they, they don't have a hundred percent composition validity, but everything have a hundred percent structure validity. So basically, what we found is that our model is the only model that have can have close to the validity uh, that is basically roughly the same as the ground truth, where all the other models are significantly worse except the uh, GCNAT, uh, which is uh, kind of a similar compared with our performance in the validity. And we further define another metric, which we call coverage. Uh, in here, we try to compare the certain, the, the, we, we try to see uh, how much, uh, so we try to compare the distribution of material we generate to the distribution of a testing material that we have reserved for the test data set. So in here, you can define two types of coverage, uh, one is uh, to, to we call coverage recall, which basically evaluates how much, so, so, so it looks at, uh, it looks at all the structures in the testing data, and uh, you wanted to see uh, how many percentage of this testing material have at least one material in our, our generated set that are class close enough to it using some fingerprint distance uh, cutoff, uh, using some fingerprint distance uh, metrics. So basically this, eva uh, this coverage recall basically evaluates the, how many of these test material has been uh, successfully generated by our model. The second is what we call coverage uh, precision, 
which is basically doing the opposite way. It looks at all the structures we generate and we're gonna find the, how many of them have at least the one material in the testing data that are close enough to it using some fingerprint distance. So this would evaluate the quality of the generating material because we would say if uh, you're joining something that is completely different from your testing data, you may be gen you're probably generating something that is very bad. So using these two metrics, we and uh, we uh, and a specific cutoff. Uh, obviously, we, we tried many different cutoff. We found that our model is the only model that close to have close to 100% coverage, uh, and this is significantly better than all the other models uh, in in the quality of generation. And finally, we look at the distribution of statistics of generated materials. So we look at the three. Three statistics, and one is the density of the material we generate, one is the energy of the material, which is predicted by a, 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 a property predictor, and last one is the number of unique elements in the material. Uh, so we, we compare uh, the, 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 the distance between the, for these properties, for, for the set of material, for the distribution of the material we generate versus the distribution of the testing material, what we found is that uh, basically CDVA is doing much better in the in the density and the energy distributions, but it has some problem in the number of unique elements. Basically, it generates on average more unique elements than the ground truth material. So you're kind of having a mixing of mode problem with the with the generative model that we have, and this is a problem that uh, we are really trying to actively resolving uh, with, with some of the research that is going on here. Uh, so finally, we have done some uh, a quantum mechanical verification of the material that we have generated. Uh, so uh, so this is a so this uses DFT to calculate uh, how stable the material we generated are. So one of the first criteria here we see was that okay, so if you generate the material, you want and uh, it, so so at the minimum requirement is that uh, the DFT calculation would converge uh, because if the uh, um, so this is uh, so if your structure generally is too bad, then maybe the DFT itself will, will not coverage. What we found is that our model is the only generative model where at least the, more than ninety percent of the model will be able to, we will be able to converge in DFT, uh, DFT while all the other models uh, have less than twenty percent. So this is the ground truth uh, materials project, which are all the stable materials. For some reason, we we did not get hundred percent. It's like ninety eight percent. Uh, so, 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 so it has already shown that our model generates much higher quality material than other models. Uh, we have further uh, uh, quantified the, the percentage of stable materials that we generate. In here, we we basically generate three thousand crystals, and around two thousand of them are converged. Uh, so we have found that maybe thirty to forty percent of these materials. Are, are within 0.1 EV convex hull. Uh, basically, it means that it has the potential to be experimentally synthesizable. And this is actually quite a high number uh, because, uh, because many of say, many of the other existing approaches cannot achieve. Uh, 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 so this is actually quite a high number, high percentage of stable material that we generate from the model. And in addition, uh, you, uh, we have around 95% of the state materials we generate are novel. They're not within, they have not been discovered before in any of the past works. Uh, so in addition, we have also explored this direction of a conditional generation. We try to minimizing the formation energy in the latent space and trying to directly generate material with low formation energy. So, uh, so, so these are the 10 kind of a, uh, optimization trajectories that we have for the material. Uh, uh, we have found that uh, basically uh, we can have uh, 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 like around 70 to 80% of success rate in generating uh, materials with formation energy that at, at the lowest 5% tire of material. And these are the two example materials that were generated. These are not cherry picked, just a randomly, randomly sampled from the material that we generate. They look quite reasonable if you are a material scientist and their formation energy are all, already at the, the lowest 5% of the, of the distribution. So we're also quite excited to see some of people, uh, some of the researchers from the community actually using our model to solve some of the real, 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 real world problems in material science. In here, they used our pep, they use our generative model to discover unknown two-dimensional materials. This is the recent work that is published. 
Uh, so they're starting from around the 2,600 uh, existing known 2D materials, and they use this to basically train a generative model uh, to generate new stable 2D materials. And they also use the substitution approach that I mentioned earlier to generate stable materials. Basically combining these two approach, they have found around uh, 11,000 stable, new stable materials, which basically expanding the known space of 2D materials by several fold. Uh, and so these are the structures. This is a TSD visualization of the generative structure from their paper. And so in here, this the blue dots are the training stable training structures, while the, the orange dots are structures generated by the substitution approach, and the, the green dots are the structure generated by our model. As you can see, it actually our model generates more diverse structures compared with the substitution approaches uh, because it was able to generate uh, new structure prototypes that is not within the uh, that is not you cannot do with uh, substitution approaches. So one thing that they found quite exciting is that there is actually a small cluster of material uh, called uh, this A B C two D two that is a new prototype of material that has never been discovered. And these are some of the visualization of the city structure of those materials. And this is actually quite new. It has not been, so, so it has not been discovered before. And our model was able to generate around 50 stable materials within this class that are within this uh, uh, 50 MeV, meaning basically they're quite stable uh, using, using computational approaches. So this is a quite exciting work, I think, of application of the CDVAE model. So in summary, uh, so uh, I have shown some of the early results that we have we have tried uh, we have demonstrated in the direction of using generative model for material discovery. So we think that there is a, a big uh, so so there's a significant so it is a very promising research area uh, going forward uh, because basically what we can do is that we can we can use all the stable materials as training data to basically train a generative model, which would allow us to discover novel materials that has not been discovered before. Uh, in addition, we can then use conditional generation to condition on the target properties that we're interested in uh, to uh, that then can directly generate materials that are actually useful. Uh, so this is one way that uh, I think how this generative model can be really used uh, to 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 uh, to move the field of material discovery forward. Basically, uh, you could imagine that we could have a central database that collects all the stable materials and their corresponding properties. And basically, this database then can be used to train a generative model, uh, uh, and then of materials. And then this generative model can be used to to propose new materials for a broad range of applications, which can then be verified using quantum mechanical calculators, CDFT. And this will generate new data, which can be then stored back into this database. So therefore, you have a this kind of an iteration group where you can both we can you can improving the, the, the material design uh, one by jointly having more data that is stored in the central database while improving this generative model and applying them to a broader range of applications. So this is a very exciting direction that uh, we are super ex uh, we are currently exploring at uh, MSR Air for Science. Uh, so I think that is basically close to the end of the talk. Uh, 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 because I think we have I have around maybe ten minutes left. I, I, I'll use maybe two or three minutes to give you a brief overview about uh, Microsoft Research Air for Science. Uh, so uh, MSI Air for Science is a new initiative that is established at Microsoft Research. We are a global institution that uh, have multiple sites around the world. Currently, we have a site in Cambridge in the UK, uh, in, in, in Beijing, Shanghai in China, uh, we, uh, in, the, in the Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and we have opened a new lab at uh, Berlin uh, in Germany, led by Frank Noy, and also, also we have a new smaller office at Vermont uh, as well. Uh, so the core mission of our initiative is that uh, we, we wanted to really use machine learning and deep learning to solve some of the biggest problems we have in the society, because uh, we, we really believe that uh, uh, it, so, the, so the power of machine learning will be able to transform 
uh, the future of science in the next decade. So we are really building a highly intensive discipline here at Microsoft Research, combining people from machine learning background, um, computational chemistry background, biology background, and software engineering really to working together to tackle some of the biggest challenges that uh, our society are facing around the theme of AI for science. And we're looking at a very broad range of topics uh, including drug discovery, material discovery, catalysis, and also look at a broader range of uh, both simulation techniques like DFT, ML potentials, and also machine learning methods like generative modeling, uh, uh, reinforcement learning, and, P and neural PD solvers, et cetera. And so, and this is our, our some team members uh, that are at Cambridge and Amsterdam. So this slide is a little bit outdated. We also have a new lab at Berlin uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, and in our team, uh, we are thinking about uh, to really rethink material discovery uh, by combining uh, innovations from both machine learning and uh, use large scale computer at Microsoft to generate huge amounts of data. At the same time, working with partners uh, around both in the industry and academia uh, to really push forward the field of machine learning guided material discovery. And uh, so our goal is really to transform material design uh, for uh, especially for sustainability related challenges. So we're a new organization. So if you're interested in us, uh, feel free to reach out to me and we have uh, many new like, in, we have intern positions and also research engineer positions. So that would be the end of the, my talk. So, uh, so I'm, I think I'm coming back to my overview slide. And uh, so feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for this great talk. So are there any questions for Jan? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have one question. Like, how big is the molecule that you're generating? And do you find it difficult to generate like large molecules rather than small molecules? Uh, so there's a bit of echoing. So uh, let me make sure that I hear your question correctly. So asking like, how big are these like crystals that we're generating? Right, what's the size of them? Uh, if this is the question. Uh, so I think uh, in in the work that we did, we're limiting ourselves into 20 atoms, but uh, we have shown that uh, this model can really also work for bigger system. Uh, we have also tried 50 atoms, all the materials that within less than 50 atoms, we don't see a significant degree uh, in the model performance. But I think in that paper, the reason that we did 20 in that paper is because all the other models works extremely bad if you do 50 atoms. So, so, so that's why we limit ourselves into 20 atoms. But we have not tried uh, like something extremely big, say like a thousand atoms. That would uh, probably the model will not work in that space. Thanks for uh, your talk. Uh, my question is about the uh, design, yeah. the application of uh, when you find uh, some new materials. Uh, what about uh, the possibility of uh, realization? Uh, sorry, it's very, uh, there's a lot of equity. Uh, can somebody repeat the question, maybe? Yeah, so he was asking about the realization. Once you have uh, generated a, a possible uh, crystal, can you realize it? So. Uh, you mean experimentally, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, no, we have not been there yet, but uh, we're trying to work with some partners to really synthesize some of the materials that we, we have. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think if you just are looking at some of the materials we're generating, they look quite reasonable. 
And uh, so this is also the, the like perception from some of our experimental collaborators, but uh, we have not really been there yet. So, so we are kind of still improving our model. Uh, so we have not really kind of at the stage where we can actually synthesize the material yet. Any other question? I, I actually, I had a question. So can we think about a quantum mechanical simulator, which is, uh, so a differentiable quantum mechanical simulator, like a differentiable DFT simulator, and then you, you run gradient descent on it to, uh, to optimize the parameter and then to generate the model in this way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great, great question. I, uh, so I, so, uh, I, I'm not sure, and I, I, I have not seen anybody. Uh, I, I see people talk about this idea, but I have never seen an example of this idea to work yet. Mm -hmm. So I personally have tried to say I train a graph neural network, and then basically, and then use the gradient to up, uh, to which predicts property of material, and then use the gradient to design some material, but uh, that turns out to be, uh, does not work, but uh, maybe I tried it in the wrong way, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's my that's my feeling. I think it's a promising research direction, and uh, but I, I just have not seen that work, but I think there's a couple of challenges as well, right? So yes, you can, you can do pipe propagate using gradient to, to update atom positions. That is basically a machine learning potential, but then how do you optimize in the discrete components mm -hmm. like at the time? So that, that, yeah, there's a ways that one could do that, but uh, I'm not sure how, like, I'm not sure like how, how good this will work. Yes. Yeah. Anyone else? So, uh, once we, uh, yeah, once we generate a new material, what kind of properties are you able to predict for this material? Or, uh, uh, kind of Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. So let, let me repeat. What kind of once you generate a material, what what properties can you uh, predict, like conductivity? Yep. And, yeah. Uh, so uh, you mean like uh, conditional generation of material condition on the property? Were interested, in, right? So we have, yeah, we have tried uh, formation energy, and uh, it it has worked very well, and. Uh, we have also tried to uh, ban the gap, but uh, that did not work very well. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we, are, we are kind of still improving the model here at MSR. So uh, yeah, but uh, we have not been there yet, but that's kind of the status, yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, so thank you very much, Jan, again for the